Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. And um, I wanna welcome you today to today's webinar, which is Managing for Climate Change in Marine Protected Areas, Stories and Tools from National Marine Sanctuaries and the National MPA Center. Um, this webinar is jointly hosted by Octo and the NOAA National MPA Center. Um, we're very pleased today to have our two presenters, uh, Zachary Canizzo and Jillian Newberger. Um, Zachary is the climate coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and National Marine Protected Area Center, where he promotes climate resilience and adaptation within national marine sanctuaries and other marine protected areas through the analysis and application of climate science and adaptation, resilience, and mitigation techniques, as well as production of tools and resources for MPA managers. His work also includes advancing the integration of natural and social sciences into the science-based design and management of marine protected areas and the application of nature-based climate solutions. Jillian Newberger serves as Climate Marine Protected Areas Associate with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, supporting the NOAA National Marine Protected Area Center. Jillian is a climate policy professional working at the nexus of environment, economic prosperity, and communities. In her current role, she builds capacity, both domestically and internationally, for responding to the causes and impacts of climate change within marine protected areas. Uh, Lauren Wenzel and Sarah Hutto from the, um, are not, unfortunately not able to make today's webinar, but we'll be filling in um, what they were gonna be presenting um, with Zach and Jillian will be presenting that information. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know before we get started with the presentation uh, that we will be doing questions afterwards. So uh, feel free to send in questions through the question panel in the user interface. Um, that's, that'll be the primary way to send in questions. Uh, we'll hold most questions until the end, but if you had a quick clarifying question, we may be able to address it during the webinar, but you're encouraged to, uh, during the presentation, sorry, uh, but you're encouraged to send in questions at any point, feel free. Uh, okay, I'll turn it over to you now, Zach. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you all for being here today. So yeah, as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna be talking about managing for climate change in MPAs. Before we dive into kind of the minutia of climate change management and MPAs, I wanna give a quick overview of the Marine Protected Area Center and the National Marine Sanctuary System. Because that's really where the stories and tools we're gonna to be highlighting today come from are from those two <clears throat> organizations. So if you haven't heard of the MPA Center before, the MPA Center is actually located within the Office of National, NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, but it's a partnership between NOAA and the Department of Interior to serve as a resource to all federal, state, territorial, and tribal programs responsible for the health of the nation's oceans. So we're within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, but we have a mandate beyond just the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. That said, of particular relevance today, we the National MPA Center is the lead for climate change within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So when we're talking about climate change stories and tools, for sanctuaries, often what we're doing is highlighting the work that's been done in sanctuaries supported by the MPA Center. So the tools that we're going to highlight today, while often targeted at sanctuaries, were also designed to be useful and usable for marine protected areas more broadly. So just wanted to make that point. And then to orient you to the National Marine Sanctuary System. So the this is a map of the National Marine Sanctuary System. And if you're unfamiliar with it, it is a system of 15 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments that is managed by NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Of relevance to today's talk, you can see how diverse the system is in terms of geography, the communities that it serves, the ecologies that are represented throughout the system, which makes managing for climate change on a system both challenging and rewarding in terms of being able to produce a broad diversity of examples and tools that can be applicable to a wide range of other marine protected areas. So while it's challenging to manage for climate change across such a broad diversity of sites and systems, it also makes the things that are produced to do so more applicable to some of the things we wanna talk about today. So now that we have that kind of orientation to both of these offices. I want to dive into climate change management in MPAs. And 
The first thing we want to highlight is this climate resilience plan. So in 2021, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries published their first ever climate change resilience plan, which was intended to guide the office in its management of climate change through 2023. So you'll notice we're in 2023 right now, but we are developing a new plan, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But this plan had four guiding goals, which are listed up on the screen and generally fall into the categories of science and assessment, adaptation, education and outreach, and green operations. And what we've done is create a climate team within the office that's broken up into four working groups under each of these goals and has pushed the work of climate change in marine sanctuaries and MPAs more broadly forward. For today, what we're going to focus on are really these two goals, science and assessment and adaptation. I'm going to largely talk about some of the science and assessment aspects, um, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Jillian to talk to Phil, to round out some of our science and assessment work and talk about adaptation. So without further ado, let's jump into that first science and assessment topic, which is understanding the impacts of climate change on our MPAs. And I'm largely going to frame this around this idea of climate vulnerability assessments but first, I want to take a moment to highlight these products here. These are the climate change impacts profiles for the National Marine Sanctuaries. Now, these profiles are short, public-facing products. They're about eight pages long, and that includes a cover page and a uh, citations page, so really six pages with a ton of pictures, in easy read. And what they do is provide an overview of the major current and projected impacts of climate change at each one of our sites. This is useful, and while not directly a tool for other MPAs, a model that we think is useful for other MPAs. First, understanding what the scientific literature says is currently happening and is projected to happen at your MPA. This really lays the groundwork for being able to understand climate change and inform additional actions that you may want to take, such as climate vulnerability assessments. In fact, what sanctuaries have done is often taken the information in these climate impact profiles as one of the first steps to providing background information when conducting a climate vulnerability assessment. And so once you have that background information of what the scientific literature says is and is likely to happen in terms of climate change hazards and impacts in your marine protected area, you can do something like dive into a vulnerability assessment. So I am going to talk about the tool that we've produced to help marine protected areas conduct vulnerability assessments, but we thought it would probably be good to orient you to what a vulnerability assessment is first. So the way that we see a vulnerability, what kind of vulnerability as we define it is actually an equation. It's a function of the sensitivity of a particular resource to a climate hazard, the exposure to that hazard, the resources likely to experience and the resources adaptive capacity to those climate hazards. So you can see our nice little flow chart here. You can think of exposure as a measure of how much change in a hazard a resource is likely to experience. So will it experience ocean acidification or uh, increased temperature? Sensitivity is a measure of whether and how much that, whether and how that resource is likely to be affected by a given change if it experiences that change, right? So a coral could be, uh, highly sensitive to increasing ocean temperature, but if it's not exposed to it, there's not much of a potential impact. And you can see that's how we calculate this idea of potential impact. What's the combination of the sensitivity and exposure? And then that final aspect is adaptive capacity, which is a measure of the ability of a resource to adapt to the effects or impacts of climate change. If a resource has high ability to adapt to a potential impact, Maybe its vulnerability is lower than a similar resource which doesn't have quite that capacity to adapt. So that's a really quick overview of how we calculate climate vulnerability. And I just want to note when I say resource, we define it incredibly broadly. Literally anything that is within a marine protected area. Species, ecosystem services, cultural and heritage resources. It's just a way for us to group all of these things we might want to assess. Now, the reason why we assess vulnerability using a climate vulnerability assessment is it allows us to tell what things are more, most vulnerable and least vulnerable, but also why they are vulnerable. Because we assess these three different aspects of vulnerability, it can help us understand why something is vulnerable, which can help us take our first steps towards adaptation actions. And that's exactly what vulnerability assessments can do. They help us to prioritize species and systems for management actions, primarily by understanding which 
resources are more or less vulnerable, but they also inform management strategies to address these vulnerabilities by targeting the particular aspect of vulnerability that is driving that vulnerability. If a species is found to be highly sensitive, maybe we target its sensitivity in order to decrease its vulnerability. In this way, vulnerability assessments allow us to efficiently allocate resources because we have an idea we can better understand what and what, what species are vulnerable or resources are vulnerable and why. What a vulnerability assessment cannot do is make a conservation decision for you. They are a tool to help you understand why a resource is vulnerable. You then have to make that decision. All right, so that's our quick overview of vulnerability assessments. But really what we wanted to share with you today is our tool. How do we conduct vulnerability assessments? It looks a lot like this. Essentially, we get subject matter experts on the resources that we are concerned with or and or at the place we are concerned with, sit down around the table and fill out these worksheets, which help us to quantitatively assess the, uh, the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity of our resources. So one step back, I said both subject matter expert and quantitatively. We are using qualitative subject matter expert opinion to assign numbers to the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity of these resources. So it is really kind of a semi-quantitative approach because we're not using anything like modeling or numbers, but because we are using we are we're using subject matter opinion to assign numbers, it is a semi-quantitative approach that allows us to actually go through and rank the vulnerability of our resources. And the tool I want to share with you today is this, our Marine Protected Area Climate Vulnerability Assessment Guide. What this tool does is take more than 10 years of experience at National Marine Sanctuaries conducting vulnerability assessments and create guidance for how marine protected areas can do that. It really has everything you need to design and conduct a vulnerability assessment. It provides an overview of the process, detailed advice and examples, and arguably most importantly, blank worksheets that you can use because these worksheets are the core of the vulnerability assessment. They're how you actually walk through it and assess vulnerability. And we provide blank worksheets for species, habitats and ecosystems, and cultural and heritage resources. So three, oh, I'm sorry, and ecosystem services as well. So four distinct types of resources, each of which is assessed slightly differently so we really feel this guide has great utility to marine protected areas. Now, I do want to give credit where credit is due. This is highly adapted from two other products that came before us that we have built on. One is the CEC Rapid Vulnerability Assessment Toolkit. The other is a more nebulous CVA process that was designed with sanctuaries in collaboration with EcoDAP. So we are really standing on the shoulders of previous people's work and taking the lessons we've learned from doing these vulnerability assessments using their tools in order to adapt these tools in ways that we feel have made have uh, been flexible and allowed for the flexibility that is often necessary in marine protected area assessment and monitoring. When you dive into that tool, you'll note that there's two different scopes of climate vulnerability assessment that it teaches you how to do. We've named these extensive and limited. Um, and that's really because the limited is an adaptation of the CEC rapid vulnerability assessment tool. The reason why we changed the name is because we found it's not actually any faster. Oftentimes, when at least the way that sanctuaries have used them, but it provides more targeted information. So we use the limited. It's not intended to be any kind of derogatory. It's just a more limited scope of your CVA because you are only assessing three climate and three non-climate hazards per resource. So a limited number of hazards versus an unlimited number of hazards, which you apply in the extensive. Both of these are very good. Both of these provide very useful and usable information to inform adaptation actions. And really the one that's right for you often just depends on the situation and what you want to assess. And the tool provides guidance and advice on how to pick which scope might be best for you, and then guidance on how to design your CBA based on your scope. It also provides a number of these worksheets. So you can see here on the left, we have the extensive version of the worksheet for assessing exposure. On the right, we have the limited version of the worksheet for assessing exposure. Again, you can see similar processes. For both of them, you are assessing 
the exposure of the resource to multiple different climate hazards, but you're doing it in a slightly different way. Same goes for sensitivity. Potential impact is calculated the same way for both. You take the combination of exposure and sensitivity. Adaptive capacity, again, same. Similar, but slightly different. And then we calculate vulnerability. So ultimately, while both of these scopes provide you with the vulnerability of the resource, that's great. But then you need to apply that vulnerability to adaptation planning. The tool does not go deeply into adaptation planning, but it does provide links and some ideas of frameworks that you can use. There are multiple different resources for how to undergo adaptation planning. And this tool is really providing what you need for conducting a vulnerability assessment and then pushing you towards other resources that can help you use that information from the vulnerability assessment to make adaptation decisions, such as this framework here by Foden et al. 2013 that specifically uses the different aspects of vulnerability to group resources into categories that can help you make decisions as to when, how, and where to take adaptation action. So I'm gonna stop talking about adaptation action before I go down a rabbit hole, because I will. And I'm going to turn it over to Jillian who's going to talk a little bit more about climate change monitoring and then dive into some tools for adaptation and resilience. So Jillian. Thank you, Zach, and hi, everybody. It's great to be with you uh, today. And as Zach said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about climate change uh, monitoring, which, oh, should we um, put up the slides? I just made you presenter. Okay, can you have to share? Yeah, I could do that one second. Let me just get it uh, pulled up. Okay. Hey, I have them up. If you just want to say, yeah, if you got them, go ahead. Yeah, can everybody see them? Is this, are we good? Yep, looks great. Awesome, thanks. Sorry about that, guys. Um, great to be here with all of you today. As Zach said, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change monitoring, which both sort of informs our understanding of climate change impacts and vulnerability and can help inform some of the actions we can take to address that. And then I'm going to talk through some of the, the tools that can help us sort of bridge that gap and, and make that jump. Um, but to start with climate monitoring, um, within the National Marine Sanctuary System, we have recently been undertaking sort of an assessment of the state of climate monitoring uh, within our sanctuaries. And the reason we've been doing that is as we try to focus on the priority of ensuring that sanctuaries and their partners have an accurate understanding of the site's vulnerabilities in the context of a changing ocean and the impacts of climate change within the site, um, we found that we sort of need to start with a baseline assessment of, of climate monitoring to help us, you know, first Jill, of all. Jill, would you be able to slow down a little bit? Sure. Okay. Um, better understand and use the climate monitoring and information that we already have. Um, so that's certainly, you know, one big priority uh, that we can achieve by, by assessing our existing monitoring. Um, we can also use that kind of an assessment to take a network approach to addressing any gaps we find in climate monitoring. Um, and we can also, you know, be um, a more, uh, a better partner to folks, academics, other agencies, state partners, et cetera, who want to work with us on addressing climate change monitoring gaps by being able to point out specific gaps as well as the existing resources available. So in order to establish that kind of a, a baseline understanding of, you know, what um, the state of climate monitoring with the National Marine Sanctuaries really is. Over the past two years, we've conducted a, a questionnaire and then climate monitoring focus groups with all of our sites grouped regionally, uh, as well as on topical areas. Um, and we've collected all of that data on, you know, what are we monitoring? What do people need to be monitoring? What are the challenges? Um, and we're in the process of analyzing it now. And I just wanted to take this opportunity today to share a few of the initial results with all of you. Um, the first result I wanted to mention is, you know, partnership is key in sanctuaries. It's, and that makes a lot of sense in terms of how we do our work generally. But when we look at monitoring, uh, we see that repeated again. Um, you know, when we look at the climate indicators that sanctuaries reported monitoring, uh, more than half of them were, reports, were, were um, reported solely by partners. 
another quarter is reported by uh, sites and partners, um, and the rest are, are sites alone or, or not specified. And that just demonstrates how, um, you know, first of all, the great partnerships that sanctuaries have. Uh, as well as, you know, the importance of thinking about when we move forward, how are we working with our partners to make sure that the data they collect is being integrated into our management um, and that we have a, a consistent and, and shareable uh, data resource there. And when I talk about partners, um, you know, one of our main partners are offices outside of the Office of National Marine Sanctuary, so others at NOAA. Um, also, you know, academic institutions, state governments, local governments and communities and tribal partners are other key stakeholders in our, in our climate monitoring process. Uh, another finding is that when we look at what sanctuaries are doing, we're doing a pretty good job on, on climate change monitoring overall. You know, generally we see that most sanctuaries are monitoring the core physical climate change indicators you might think of. So water temperature is monitored everywhere, you know, um, pH, sea level rise, some of these core indicators are very consistently monitored. And when we take even a broader look at uh, a list of um, recommended indicators developed at a, a workshop for us, um, we find that, um, you know, most of the sites are monitoring against most of um, most of those indicators. Um, that said, you're going to be say most and some, and there are some gaps that we've identified uh, so far. And that is in terms of both, you know, making sure that we're all monitoring the same sort of core set of physical indica indicators to understand climate change uh, impacts. And also that we are, you know, expanding our climate change monitoring to meet the needs of sites. So some sites, you know, have specific uh, biological indicators they want to be monitoring in terms of the impact of ocean acidification on a keystone species, maybe, or um, want to expand our socioeconomic monitoring, which is one area where sanctuaries are, are sort of um, currently recording less than around physical uh, or biological indicators. So there are, are spaces to grow. And as we think about that, you know, what we found is it's very important to remember that every sanctuary is really different, right? And their needs are different. So even something like um, sea level rise, which we might think of as sort of a, a base uh, climate indicator, climate change indicator, um, you know, it's not going to be super relevant to one of our, our solely offshore sites, for example. So there needs to be flexibility, but that doesn't mean that, you know, first of all, there can't be some standardization where that's relevant for some of these key indicators. Um, and that we, you know, um, can't still take a system approach to how we think about and collaborate on um, sharing uh, that monitoring and, and our experience within the system with our partners and publicly. Uh, so those are some of the core findings in relation to what we're monitoring. And I thought another interesting finding that's kind of relevant to the tools we're going to discuss today is when we asked folks, you know, how are you using uh, the climate change monitoring data that you have, um, the understanding of what it means to use that data was really diverse and, and not consistent. And so there's still work to be done as we understand how do we take the information uh, that we have about climate change impacts and turn that into management action. So if this was interesting to you, you know, um, congratulations or, or good news, I should say. Uh, we'll have uh, more publicly shareable and detailed products coming out on this soon. In the next couple of, of months, we hope to be able to share uh, a framework document that includes some of these findings, ideas for moving forward, as well as a complete inventory of all the monitoring that is, is ongoing in sanctuaries and, and who's conducting that work. Um, so now I wanna sort of turn to talking about tools that can assist us in thinking about how we um, you know, integrate uh, these, these, the data we have on climate change impacts, on the vulnerability of sites um, and what climate change uh, means for different protected areas into our management. I wanna start by sharing with you a uh, product that was recently released by um, IUCN, as well as the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and that's the Climate Change Resilience and Adaptation Planning Tool, or CCRAPT, as I, I like to affectionately uh, refer to it. Um, sorry, CCRAPT um, is our, um, this is an, basically an assessment and planning resource for MP managers uh, that helps them identify sort of areas of strength um, and opportunities for improvement on how climate change is considered within uh, within their site. So um, the tool itself, sorry, uh, the tool itself includes uh, a story map, um, and that's a publicly posted uh, resource, and we can drop a link in the chat uh, that you can use to um, sort of read about what the tool covers and how it can be used. And it also includes an Excel tool um, that can help sites in in sort of really getting into the assessment component of the resource. And what it does is it gives them an opportunity to talk about their climate change threat, 
And then it really helps you think through how are you responding to those in the context of monitoring, vulnerability assessments, resilience and adaptation, uh, mitigation efforts and education, and a little bit of what the Excel tool uh, looks like here. This tool is really designed to produce actionable results. That was very important to us when we created it. What I mean by that is the questions are all focused on criteria and actions under the control of MPA managers and staff. Um, and so what that means is they're, they're really meant to be to produce ideas for improvement, and that's built into the tool. You have to provide a, a score for questions, but you also um, need to input ideas for improvement. And there's sort of a, um, a bank of ideas that you can build on and use. Um, so that's one priority for the tool. The other priority we had when we created the tool was that it should be complementary and not duplicative or, or complicating when it comes to all of the different tools and resources that MPA managers are already working with regularly. And so as you'll see, if you if you use the tool, is it's integrated um, integrated throughout the tool or references to key resources that folks can use um, as they think about operationalizing uh, gaps that they identify. The tool is also very explicit about how you can integrate the results of this tool into other reporting mechanisms you might be considering. So what are the relevant green list indicators that, that we're speaking to here or how, I mean, I know Octo had a great webinar on RSAP recently, um, you know, how does, uh, how can answers to this tool impact how you use RSAT? And so it's really designed with that integration in mind. Uh, in terms of that sort of a description of the tool, but in terms of where it is right now, uh, it was officially launched just in, in March of 2023 at the Our Ocean Conference. Um, so it's still in a very sort of early stage. It was pilot tested before launch and received initial positive feedback from uh, two sites, including Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary uh, and East Marine Parks in, in Parks Australia. Um, but we know that this tool, like any tool, is uh, you know definitely meant to be updated. And something we're really excited about is the opportunity to work with folks directly as they use the tool and to identify you know how can we make it more useful. We've already been thinking about how it can support MPA networks more broadly and activity considerations, and how can we make it more actionable. Um, and I think the best way we can do that is to see how sites do. Um, put it into action. Um, so if you're interested, we'll, we'll drop a link, but you can also take a picture of this QR code or, or reach out to me directly um, because we're really excited that we want to give the tool a try. So uh, CCRF is an international tool. And one thing that we um, try to do in the National MPA Center is to really take the work that sanctuaries are doing and the expertise on our team and share it internationally. Um, and use it to sort of contribute to global efforts to um, protect marine areas. Uh, so as a part of that, um, I wanted to share one specific project with you today. Um, we uh, at the National MPA Center, and, uh, under the leadership of the Climate Program Office, implement something called the Blue Carbon Inventory Project. This is a US State Department funded project that is focused on providing international um, capacity building and technical assistance within two focus areas. Um, including blue carbon and national greenhouse gas inventories and supporting habitat conservation uh, of blue carbon habitats. And mostly we focus on coastal blue carbon, um, uh, so seagrasses and wetlands in particular. Uh, the program is running since September 2020. Uh, you know, some of you might remember a sort of large pandemic that disrupted things right around that time. So, you know, um, it's getting off to a slower start, but it's now fully in gear uh, in our last year, running through March 2024. And currently, we are working with or scoping work with Costa Rica, Ghana, Senegal, Indonesia, and India. And I want to say we do all this work very closely with a range of partners. You know, of course, we're, we're very closely partnered with the national governments um, in, in the countries where we're working. Um, but we also work uh, with partners like Sylvester and Climate Associates that support a lot of our uh, inventory-related work. The Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is also a partner, along with the Ocean Foundation and the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And then, of course, uh, we engage a lot of parts of the interagency, um, you know, so State Department, USAID, and EPA, for example. So that's one example of a, a project that we're implementing. Um, and now I just wanted to sort of end my component of it by talking with you all a little bit about um, climate change. Uh, and some of the work that we're doing in that space. Um, so I'm going to pull up uh, another um, I'm going to pull up the website one second. Uh, While well, Jillian's pulling that up, I will note that I have dropped every resource that we have talked about thus far into the chat. So take a look at those links uh, towards the end of the webinar.
Um, okay, so you know something that the sanctuaries have been increasingly thinking about is in under the sort of reality of the changing ocean that we're facing, knowing the impacts of climate change we're already seeing and that we will be seeing, um, you know, how can we best support sanctuaries in adapting to that reality and, and how can they support their surrounding communities in adapting to uh, climate change? And so over the past year or so, we've undertaken this effort of really, um, you know, inventorying within sanctuaries what climate change adaptation is going on. Um, and we want to talk a little bit about the results. So I'm going to show you right now a story map we have on this product uh, that you can also access online. And I hope you'll have a chance to sort of look through it independently. As we've sort of been talking about, you know, what climate change is happening in sanctuaries, we realized pretty quickly, or what climate change adaptation is happening in sanctuaries, we realized pretty quickly that the first question we had to answer is, what is adaptation? Because we would have these conversations where it was clear folks had a very different understanding of, of what Jillian, climate change adaptation is. If you could yeah. slow down again, thank you. Um, climate change adaptation can be understood as sort of any policy or management action um, that you know allows us or intended is, is tended to allow resources, services, communities, or infrastructure to um, prepare for future changes in climate by reducing their vulnerability and or increasing their resilience um, and adaptive capacity to the impact. Uh, so it's a pretty expansive definition, and it includes you know a lot of things. Um, you can think about, you know, certainly it can include mitigation or assessment, but it's also distinct from those things. I think wetlands can be a great example. Um, you know, you could restore a uh, wetland to address increased uh, likelihood of flooding as a result of climate change, and that's an adaptation action. But, you know, it could also be uh, increasing carbon storage, and so it could be thought of as blue carbon and mitigation. Uh, and depending on how you're conducting sort of assessment um, within that wetland, it could also be, you know, assessment that informs adaptation as well. So uh, we sort of started with that definition and then we said, and of course, you know, successful adaptation is adaptation that serves uh, the community um, where it's, it's sort of being delivered and implemented. And so equitable uh, adaptation that is conducted with partners is important when we think about what climate change adaptation is. So with that definition, we looked across the sanctuaries and said, OK, what are we doing on climate change adaptation? And we were excited to see that, you know, basically every sanctuary um, is implementing adaptation actions right now. Uh, and so I encourage you to sort of come to this map and, and click around and see what we're doing in all our sanctuaries. I'm going to show a, a few examples right now um, that demonstrate the diversity of adaptation. So, for example, uh, our Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is doing some really exciting work on coral restoration. And so they are restoring coral that's been damaged by certainly climate change uh, impacts, disease, um, extreme weather, but also just human impacts, uh, vessel grounding and things like that. Um, but they've been restoring uh, coral reefs in a way that makes them more resilient to climate change by introducing more climate tolerant and disease resilient corals, as well as removing nu nu nuisance and invasive species and reintroducing herbivores to just create a more resilient um, uh, system more broadly. So that's one sort of restoration example of adaptation. But adaptation can also be education and outreach. When you're doing education and outreach, that sort of better informs a community or a public um, so they can take actions that make their natural resources more resilient to climate change, you're helping to sort of drive um, to drive climate change uh, adaptation. And a great example is the work on the Coral Checkup Lesson Series that's happening in Papanam Mukokea Marine National Monument. Um, they've been doing this uh, great um, student-focused Coral Checkup Lesson Series um, that's designed to teach students about coral reefs and coral reef monitoring in the context of a changing climate and encourage them to be better stewards of, of local reefs. Um, and this, you know, in turn helps produce the increase the adaptive capacity of these reefs that are under less pressure um, from human activity. I know I've said partnerships a couple of times in relation to national marine sanctuaries, but it really is just core to what we do. And we can also use our partnerships, and we have been using our partnerships to support restoration. Uh, Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary is a great example of that. Uh, they have sort of realized that in the area, as a result of climate change and human disruption to natural sediment flows, uh, there's been um, sort of increased uh, coastal flooding risk um, and increased coastal vulnerability. And so one thing that they've done is founded a, a North Central California Coastal Sediment Coordination Committee, um, which has brought together leaders sort of across levels of government um, to work on some coastal resilience programming in the area, which has been really 
uh, an effective way to drive adaptation. And then of course, we can also be um, collecting and, and using data and applying data in a way that supports adaptation. I think a great example of this is the work that Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary is doing as an ocean acidification sentinel site in partnership with a lot of other folks um, and organizations in their community and area. And it's really preparing them um, to adapt to the climate change impacts of, uh, of ocean acidification in particular. So that's sort of a couple of examples of how we're seeing adaptation, uh, you know, really implemented um, across the sanctuary system. But what we've been trying to do now is take this um, sort of breadth of activities and learn from them, both for sanctuaries and for, for hopefully other protected areas and other folks looking to drive adaptation. Um, and some key findings we've had is that, you know, adaptation and partnership is successful adaptation, and that's a real priority for, for sanctuaries and, and in our work. Another finding has been that, you know, adaptation, it's a broad definition and it can look very different in different sites. And so adaptation that is really specialized um, to what sanctuaries do and to what their communities are engaged in um, is often the most successful. And that finally, you know, adaptation so often, you know, really depends on support from community. And so working with their community um, to engage them in climate change adaptation has been one key uh, success for national marine sanctuaries. Um, so I hope you can, can use this resource maybe to, to do that yourself and, and feel free to take a look at some of the other adaptation resources we have linked in here. And with that, I will turn it back over to Zach. Thanks, Jan. All right, I'm going to steal the uh, screen back from you. And so what we've talked about to this point is what we've been doing as sanctuaries and the Marine Protected Area Center to drive climate management and adaptation forward. But we aren't content just sitting on our laurels. We wanna to look to the future and continue to build on what we've done in order to continue to address climate change in national marine sanctuaries and produce tools and resources that are useful to both sanctuaries and other marine protected areas. Ultimately, our goal is to provide the information and tools needed to help MPA managers meet their climate assessment, adaptation, and mitigation goals towards the overarching goal of achieving a more adaptive and sustainable ocean. And one of the first steps that, that, we're, that we're going to be taking to advance this climate spark management is to create a new climate resilience plan in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, it will probably be called something fancy and bureaucratic like Office of National Marine Sanctuaries Climate Resilience Plan FY23 to 26, but I am lovingly referring to it as the Resilience Plan 2.0. We are developing a new resilience plan that's going to build on the lessons learned in the implementation of the first plan and guide the National Marine Sanctuary System towards a more adaptive and sustainable management over the next at least three years and probably longer. In fact, we are kicking off that process this week to design that new plan so that it will be ready to go as soon as we enter our new fiscal year 24 in October. <clears throat> we are also more broadly, uh, both within the National Marine Sanctuary System and broadly across MPAs, trying to move towards adaptation. In particular, providing tools and guidance to help MPA managers develop and implement adaptation strategies. We're going to continue to assess climate impacts and vulnerabilities but we feel like we're at a point where we have produced tools, advice, and experiences on how to assess the current and projected impacts of climate change to MPAs and vulnerabilities. And we're starting to get to that point in a number of national marine sanctuaries where we need to move beyond that. We need to start taking at, uh, adaptation action. So this group is trying to help push us in that direction through things like creating a adaptation community of practice within sanctuaries where hopefully we can take those lessons that are learned within National Marine Sanctuaries as we implement adaptation actions and provide tools and resources that can be useful to marine protected areas more broadly as we collectively move towards that larger goal of a more adaptive and sustainable ocean. So that's all we have today. That's enough of us talking at you. We have plenty of time to hear from you all and we would love to answer questions if you have them. And I'm gonna go ahead and put up this kind of pretty slide while we answer questions because I think it provides a little bit of a more hopeful message as we talk about what you all want to know.
thank you so much, Zach and Jillian. This was great. And it's great to learn about all these tools. It's uh, really impressive what's coming out uh, from the National Marine Sanctuaries and, and NOAA Marine Protected Area Center these days. So um, I wanted to let everyone know um, to ask questions, just type them into the question panel and um, we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, let's see. So there was an early question that came in. Um, is the is National Marine Sanctuaries helping to build digital twins, commuter models of sanctuary ecosystems? Could be as simple as coordinating the data collection to be useful for building digital twins with artificial intelligence. Short answer is not that I'm aware of. Um, uh, we don't have much expertise in the program uh, on artificial intelligence. We have one person that I'm aware of who is working with some neural network models, but um, I, I am unaware of any individual site and I know headquarters is not working on any digital twins, but that would definitely be an interesting project to work with a partner on who has those expertise. Okay, thank you. Um, a comment that came in, hi, from the UK, really interesting talk. You might be interested to hear about some work we, the Wildlife Trusts, um, RSPB and WWF are involved in mapping blue carbon, including within marine protected areas in the UK. And then they give a, a URL, which I'll copy over to the uh, chat in just a second. So that was more of a comment. Um, for another question, um, what is missing from CC wrapped in terms of observations and modeling? Yeah, so I can speak a little bit to, to the degree to which CCRAP integrates that. So CCRAP has a climate threats component where you can enter sort of what um, you think your primary climate threats are given observations and given monitoring. Um, so that's what we have so far. But there have been a lot of conversations as we've started to share it with folks about, you know, we want it to be low burden and we want it to focus on some of the management activities because there are tools like climate vulnerability assessments um, they can get more deeply uh, into those sort of considerations. But we have had discussions as we rolled it out about, you know, is there, um, is there more that we can do there? Should that be required rather than optional? And how can we think about um, incorporating considerations uh, that you see with models like uncertainty into how we record trust there? So that's one area um, of growth that we're looking at as we, we think about um, improving the tool in the future. Okay, great. Um, how would you, oh, let's see. Thanks for the great talk. How are social factors, that is, uh, are, for example, equity of access to resources among MPA stakeholders included in the tool and adaptation process? Yeah, the social side, the social aspect of Marine protected areas and climate change is something that we recognize we need to do a better job at assessing and implementing. It is a area of great interest to sanctuaries. Um, the expertise to incorporate it, it differs from sanctuary to sanctuary. Some sites are working very heavily on it. For example, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Others simply don't have the expertise to have done it thus far. Uh, the tool that I'm most familiar with that I, where I can speak to it a bit would be the Climate Vulnerability Assessment Guidance. And that guidance does provide um, <clears throat> some strategies and information to include communities and uh, communities, ecosystem services, social aspects of marine protected area interactions into the vulnerability assessment. And in particular, also is very insistent on ensuring that marine protected area managers include members of the community in the vulnerability assessment process to both draw on their expertise of the community, what does the community want to see and what is the community witnessing in terms of climate change, and to ensure that they are addressing the needs and vulnerabilities of that community as we assess vulnerability. Um, ultimately, I would say that the blanket statement is that the social science side of it is something we are working on trying to do better at and learn how to integrate it. 
we recognize that it's important and we absolutely always recommend and try our best to interact with communities and stakeholders when we are developing adaptation actions and assessing vulnerability. Great, thank you, Zach. Um, let's see, other questions. Um, I'm having trouble with my question screen. Um, this is all fantastic. As sanctuaries and MPAs continue to implement adaptation management strategies and action, and then given some time to see how things pan out, to then measure effectiveness of adaptation action, it would be great to see a compilation of best practices for successful monitoring, suggestions on metrics to use to see if action has led to increased adaptive capacity. Is this something uh, you guys are thinking about? Yes, absolutely. Um, this conversation around how to measure success and measure effectiveness of our adaptation actions is one that comes up a lot. We are working on how to try and measure that. Um, as Jillian mentioned, the sanctuaries in general are just starting to move into actual adaptation actions. So integrating such measures from the very beginning is something that we are encouraging and trying to ensure that we, we do. But as you mentioned, we're, we're, we're moving into this space. So we don't have metrics yet, but it's absolutely something that we will share if we're successful, of course. Um, Jillian, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, it's definitely something we um, are thinking about and, and wanna be working on more. Okay, thank you guys. Um, question, let's see. Are there any socioeconomic considerations included in vulnerability assessments? Ecosystem services such as cultural, heritage, and recreation are a good start, but are there any efforts to quantify changes in resources as it pertains to livelihoods and more directly measurable connections to human use and changes imposed by a changing climate? So uh, that is a really good question in terms of Sorry, I'm reading. I'm reading the question again um, to make sure that I that I fully understand it. Um, efforts to quantify changes in resources that pertains to livelihoods that more directly measure both connections to human use and changes imposed by a changing climate. The answer is both yes and it depends on where you are. Oh no, we may have lost Julian. Um, Yes, some sites are absolutely working on this. Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary is a really good example, working closely with the coastal treaty tribes who have usual and accustomed areas in the sanctuary are very, um, very focused on trying to understand the changes uh, in the sanctuary and how that is affecting the lives, livelihoods and cultures of these coastal treaty tribe partners. From a broader aspect, sanctuaries are interested in this, but in general don't have the expertise to do it themselves and are working with partners to try and better understand, partners within NOAA and outside of NOAA, to better understand how we can do this. I am aware of one um, partnership in particular with an academic partner that is trying to do exactly this, trying to better understand how we can measure these connections and quantify the impacts of these changes on the lives and livelihoods of communities that depend on sanctuaries and the resources found within them. This is a critically important question and uh, we're absolutely trying to find the partners and the methodologies to make sure that we can do this. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, another question that came in, um, sanctuary managers need short-term forecasts to be able to address current changes. Is CC wrapped addressing short-term forecasts of changes, for example, for coral reef habitats? If no forecasting is available now, are you planning to add this to the tool? Yeah, that's a great question. So the tool itself um, doesn't include any, any built-in forecasting. You would take the information that you have available and sort of input it into the tool. Uh, the tool, in terms of how it assesses your um, areas of needs and, and spaces for improvement would identify, for example, that short-term forecasting is a need that isn't being met and that's impacting your ability to 
to address climate change within the sanctuary. So it could identify that as a as a um, issue, but it won't itself. Um, it doesn't itself include any short term forecasting. You know, I think in general, in terms of the monitoring work we're thinking of doing just for sanctuaries, you know, that's certainly somewhere where um, we have heard folks uh, stress the importance of having access to sort of real time, uh, real time information and also an understanding of near term changes. So as we think about what sort of comprehensive climate change monitoring in the sanctuaries look like, I think we're we're working towards um, addressing those needs. But CC Wrapped itself um, is not going to provide you with with information like that. Uh, it just it uses your inputs and it identifies gaps like that. Okay, thank you, Jillian. Um, couple more questions. Let's see. Um, what products from ocean modeling could be useful for developing CC Wrapped? That's a great question. I'm just sort of thinking about that. You know, I think um, one thing that we often hear, uh, and this is maybe more broadly about sites as they as they think about the climate change impacts they they need to accommodate, is the importance for downscaled models and really understanding regional local uh, projections in terms of climate change impacts. So I think that in terms of being able to correctly identify your threats um, in order to inform some of the the management work. Uh, that CCRAP is helping you do. I think that that's um, certainly an important area. Um, and otherwise, I just I think that's a great question. I'd have to, to think about it a little bit more. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's see. A question: Knowing that NOAA is pushing for Climate Ecosystem Fisheries Initiative (CEFI), how do you think CEFI effort? could help with developing decision support tools that are relevant to sanctuaries and MPAs. Yeah, all right, we're getting into some inside baseball here. Yeah, the Climate Ecosystem Fishery Initiative, for those who um, might not be aware of it, is an initiative within NOAA that is attempting to bring together <clears throat> um, the climate side of what NOAA does with the fisheries and ecosystem sides in order to leverage NOAA's ability to um, to measure, monitor, and forecast climate change and do so in a more applied way, uh, particularly related to NOAA's fisheries and ecosystem mandate. So that's a quick overview of CEFI as I understand it. I'm sure someone in the chat can uh, correct me if I missed something there. But CEFI is definitely something that sanctuaries have engaged with and have engaged with from the beginning. Um, we are trying to find the best places to integrate ourselves into CEFI, largely sanctuaries and MPAs more generally, because there are other NOAA MPAs, such as the National Estuarine Research Research System, tend to see ourselves as the, uh, as the users of the products that would come out of CEFI. A lot of the CEFI products would provide some of these short-term forecasts and models that were mentioned earlier would be useful. So where um, Sanctuary sees itself is hopefully engaging early on in order to help ensure that the tools and products that are being created through this initiative are useful, usable, and used to Sanctuary and other MPA managers. And then doing everything we can to make sure that we're applying these tools when they are created and are useful, because there is a large opportunity through this initiative to much better integrate what NOAA does across its huge breadth of offices and expertise to push us as an organization forward in a purposeful and meaningful way towards getting these products that our fisheries and ecosystem managers need to address the issues of climate change. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Um, we have several other questions. Um, some are not directly related. Um, let's see, but there was a question. How would you briefly describe this project for people, um, for, the, the, for the general public so they have a better understanding of what's been done? I guess it would depend on the project because um, we've talked about multiple different projects here, but I would say overall, um, how I would describe everything is that the National Marine Protected Area Center and Office of National Marine Sanctuaries 
are trying to make sure that we incorporate and consider climate change in everything that we do so that we can better manage for and address the effects of climate change on the resources that we are supposed to be protecting and stewarding for the American people. So we are trying to address this massive global problem at the local scale so that we can be sure that these places that the American people have entrusted to us continue to persist and provide the resources, the sense of place, and the enjoyment for years and decades to come that were intended when they were initially protected. OK, thank you, Zach. Um, and there's been a request for the story map, so I'll repost that. That is in the uh, chat, but I'll repost that. Let's see. Um, okay, that's done. Um, there's a, a response. Thanks for the presentation. Glad the CEFI was mentioned. Yes, CEFI was specifically designed to provide MPA and other resource managers with operational forecasts, projections of future ocean ecosystem conditions, and turn that into advice for climate-informed decision-making. Um, and there's a link to a fact sheet. Um, we posted one, but I'll, I'll post the second link too. Okay, um, I think that does it for the, the questions. Um, if anybody has any others, we'll go ahead and send it in right now and we can handle it. But thank you so much, uh, Jillian and Zach. This was a great presentation. It's wonderful learning about all these tools. And um, we also appreciate you filling in for colleagues who weren't able to make it. Um, so not seeing any other questions, let's, um, we'll go ahead and end in the webinar and thank you again so much for presenting and thank you everyone who's able to make it today thank you everyone um i will note i neglected to put my email on any slide here which was just an oversight on my part i've dropped my email in the uh chat feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions or uh, any want to chat about anything that we've talked today always happy to talk more Okay. Thank you, Zach. All right. And thank you guys. And hope we see everybody at a future webinar. Okay. Bye.